What is up? I am just waiting for things to show up here. I'm streaming on my Zoom, so it gets kind of weird. It's always kind of like a delay and uh, when it says go live. What is up, beautiful people of my trigger, uh, our Trigger Proof Facebook community and also uh, on YouTube, on the YouTube channel. You Either way where you're watching, please make sure you comment. Let me know what your biggest revelations are. I absolutely love the DMs and emails that I'm getting from you um, sharing how this work has been impacting you. If you're brand new, welcome. My name's Dr. Nima Romani. Um, I started off as a chiropractor in my previous life and discovered a huge aha moment several years ago, I think about 10 years ago, which had me completely changing what I offered to my clients. And I realized that uh, people were coming in to see me with stress-related problems. And I created workshops in my office to help people go upstream to find the root cause of why they were seeing me in the first place. Because that wasn't, wasn't getting very inspiring to me to see people coming in for the uh, as a result of all of their attachment traumas and their unresolved grief and their relationship conflict dynamics and their divorce and their grief that hadn't really healed and these open loops happening in their relationships unresolved will show up at the end stage of our experience which is in our body and as a mass as a, a student of the nervous system and human physiology i was always fascinated by why some of my patients got really really great results and others no matter what we threw at them um, they just wouldn't get better and my ego couldn't really handle it so i created these workshops when i realized that the unresolved psychological uh wounds manifest as physical if you're dealing with a chronic illness like fibromyalgia, Lyme disease, chronic fatigue, digestive issues, chronic inflammatory bowel problems. I'm sure you've done all the doctor stuff, but they just really deal with a surface level. And I started after 10, 20 years of any practitioner doing good work, start to see a human being as far deeper layers than just the structural surface. You know that you are an ecosystem. You already know that the environment that you're around, the content that you put into your mind, <laughs> the quality of the conversations that you have around the other beings in your world, you download their subconscious beliefs and that impacts you. That has an impact in your body. It's not everybody else's fault, you're not a victim, but what you put into your body in terms of content in terms of conversation, in terms of thought, in terms of empowering beliefs or disempowering beliefs, which are all in your subconscious. You're not even aware of them. They've, down, they've been downloaded from your parents, 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 and here we are having this conversation. Um, without an awareness and a real kind of examination of these stories and these past beliefs and these woundings, we then walk around the planet completely unconscious. And unfortunately, this unconsciousness has to kind of expose, become exposed somewhere. And what happens is that we attract these wake-up calls into our lives. And as a practitioner, I would notice people coming in with back pain, neck pain, chronic jaw pain, migraines for prolonged periods, but what, which, you know, from a chiropractic standpoint, as I'm examining you, I can examine your spine, but we don't really go deeper into wondering why don't you feel safe in your body in the first place? <clears throat> why is it that all of these symptoms started happening after you found out about your husband's affair? Why is it that these, these diseases and disorders and this diagnosis of cancer that you got um, and you can feel exactly where it is. Why is it that when you think about your past uh, traumas and your um, your father's sexual assault, sexual abuse of you, why is it that, that there, you have a pain in your body in the exact location of where the cancer is? These are all real life examples that I kept seeing in my practice to the point where I got frustrated and I thought, all right, I got to leave and I got to teach people um, 
what I've learned to be true about the importance of not taking blame, <clears throat> but taking responsibility to realize that the that the illness or the or the the illness, the the body sensations, the migraines, the digestive issues, the chronic fatigue, the fibromyalgia, the chronic pain, you're not actually a victim to this disorder that's outside of you. No, in fact, you're not just the victim, you're also the perpetrator. In other words, you are not to fault, you're not to blame, but you have possibility, you have capability, you have responsibility. The three words that are terrifying to people who are stuck in their wounds, there's no possibility. Definitely no responsibility. If I can play the victim, then I'm not responsible. I want other people. I'm just going to wait for a doctor to come save me, which is my next point. If you don't really see that you are not the to blame, but also a contributor to, and a perpetrator to the, 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 the dynamic, if you don't see that, then you're always going to be looking for a hero outside of you. And people were coming to me to be their hero, which was great because that catered to my kind of egotistical nature of why I became a chiropractor in the first place, in the first place, because I just wanted to be a hero. But here's what's interesting about that in my own spiritual development in this, is that the more I try to be the hero or rescuer to people, that cause of their thing, I thought it was to help other people, but in reality, it was actually to help me feel less insignificant. And if you find the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because if I'm talking to you and you're in this in my universe of content, chances are you categorize as kind of like a pleaser, a fixer, a helper, <clears throat> a rescuer, a savior. No judgment. It's just this is what we notice. This is a part of the conversation I'm about to have in terms of re rejection and resentment and stuff like that is that without understanding how this dynamic works, you then mistakenly go out thinking, oh, I'm just such a pleaser. I just say yes to everyone. It's always about others, da, 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 da. Not realizing unconsciously, we, I say we because I am, I was doing the same thing in my own way. I was trying to have significance. In other words, I was compensating for the insignificant little boy inside of me, which we all have, by the way. So there's no shame in it. It's just, we then don't address it, we don't admit that it's there, we try to hide it, uh, or we resent that part of us. So we do all sorts of crazy shit to pretend like it's not there, like be super duper successful and become CEOs and have six-figure companies and seven-figure companies and buy expensive things and show off my beautiful body to millions of followers on Instagram and get that external validation to compensate for the fact that we are missing that inside. Nothing that I'm saying to you is actually new to you. But what I discovered was that if, if we didn't understand and go after and heal what, the, what this was really about, we're always in the content of the illness, the relationship challenge, the, the person who is, is, is being mean to us or a person who is rejecting us. So this conversation that you're in the middle of right now is a new one. It's very different than what you've heard out there before. And it's a, finally a, an idea that's, whose time has now come. <laughs> because we have seen too many memes and, and schools of thought on social media that we want to blame narcissists and this people. And we're just, we are in a, in a society that just fucking perpetuates the victim narrative so much that we have now adopted it as our reality. And, and that's fine because the, the first thing that happens when you get hurt by somebody or something, you have every right. In that moment, there's a perpetrator and there's a victim. But what happens is when we go into these support groups and we tell our woe is me story, we unknowingly are trying to get external validation. But unknowingly, over time, Three years later, four years later, if you're still talking five years later, even fucking two, three years later about the same story about your mother or about your ex, chances are you are living in a perpetual victim narrative. In other words, it's become your identity. You, if you're like most of the people that I meet in that space, 
they're just blinded to the fact they're so possessed by it they don't realize that that story of suffering has become their identity so they claim to talk about the story and tell me let me tell my story my story we get these five i get these dms with like 10 pages and i'm just like oh goodness more content to tell the story to justify how i'm feeling unknowingly giving our power away and the only question if you truly want to heal you want to ask yourself is how can i take responsibility not blame not blame but responsibility for healing the parts of myself that unfortunately went through those scenarios when i was a child because if i don't if i don't address those what ends up happening is these unconscious complexes from childhood literally run our lives and it's as though you're in the back seat being driven by them you know in case you were wondering just look back on some of the conflicts that you've had in your relationship over the last week the question you want to ask is how old do i feel like i'm showing up as and the answer is right there because now once you've gotten triggered in these conflicts here we go. You're now no longer the functional adult who's 40, 45 years old. No, no, you're nine years old now. And you're looking for support with other nine-year-olds stuck at that same wound and other nine-year-olds, and by that I mean people who've regressed because of their wounding, listening to your story will go, oh, me too, me too, me too. And you're other, around in the other nine-year-olds and it feels so validating because God, it feels so good to know that you're not alone. It feels so good. It's not my fault. I've been blaming myself. It's so relieving. Oh, I got the diagnosis. Finally, someone has told me what's wrong with me. Oh, I feel so relieved, right? There's a, there's a drawback to that. Unfortunately, many who get the diagnosis or you know hear that validation externally immediately unconsciously wash their hands of all responsibility of actually changing or transforming themselves. The labels come in, which is the medical system will give you a label, and then you're like, oh, it's the fibromyalgia. My choices don't matter. It's the fibro. That's why I'm sad. That's why I'm this. It's the fibro. In other words, this thing outside of me, not realizing it's not your fault, but it's within you all along. And so I, ha I left my chiropractic profession because I, I was so frustrated in seeing these kinds of patients that I decided that I don't want to work with them anymore. I only want to work with people that are actually wanting to heal. Most people just want to be validated for their story. This is a, this is a very big aha that I had. This is what led me out of leave, and leaving chiropractic is that about 80% of people coming in with complaints aren't willing to do the actual inner work it takes to get to the root cause. You know, most just want to be heard because they weren't seen and heard by their mother and father. So they go to doctors, one doctor after another, tell their stories. And it feels good to have a professional, you know, sit there and listen to you and go, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Or go to a counselor for 20 fucking years, say the same thing. We have clients that go, I've been doing 20 years of counseling. And the person still hates their mother, right? I'm just like, mm, you've likely been going to a support worker who's been nodding their head going, oh, yeah, poor thing. It's their fault. You have no responsibility in it. And the reason why I left chiropractic was because if I, I would keep getting these intuitive hits and going, you're so full of shit. I wanted to tell my clients, my patients, stop bullshitting yourself. You have some fucking blind spots. <laughs> you have some responsibility in this. And when I would say that, I could get me in trouble because then if you didn't feel like I served you properly or I said something that offended you, you could then write a letter to the board of chiropractors and then they will come down hard on me because I wasn't nice to you. And I really fucking hated that. It was creating this anxiety within me. You know, that's what anxiety actually is, is when you abandon yourself. So I found myself having to abandon myself in my practice in order to be nice and be professional because I was getting complaints that I was being unprofessional when I would tell people, uh, yeah, there's a hidden motive behind your chronic pain. You just can't see it. Why don't you admit the truth of what you're getting out of it 
so that you can finally heal. What? Are you saying it's my fault? Ah, writing a letter. It didn't happen that way, but I could, I was afraid of it happening. And so slowly I worked my way out of that thing and I just basically created my own universe online and I just started sharing my story. And so the cool part is, is that some of the stuff that I'm going to say to you might trigger you. I'm going to share, we're going to talk about rejection in a moment, might trigger you. But the cool part is, is that if you don't like what I'm saying, you just hit this one button. It says unsubscribe or delete and boom, you are banished from my universe. You never have to put up with my shit again. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Good riddance. That's okay. Because I'm not talking, I'm not trying to convert anybody anymore. I'm done trying to convert anybody. I've just got, I just got tired of it. I am done trying to convert people to taking responsibility for their own healing. When in a world where everybody just wants somebody else to rescue them. So who's going to pay for it? Somebody else could, could, could uh, me taking responsibility to heal myself. No, it's got to be somebody else. Like, oh, fuck, get me out of there. So I now can talk into a camera and say whatever the fuck I want. I can speak my truth. If it, if it, if it doesn't suit you, you can always leave. But what I've discovered is that if you're like most people, you're tired of the bullshit and you're ready to just cut to the chase. When we get on discovery calls with people, I always ask people, <clears throat> why is it that you want to work with me? And they say, because I've gone to counselors. I've just been talking about the same thing with therapists for 20 years, 10 years. I just want somebody to just, to, just, just call me. Like I, I want to, I, I, I need to be called out. I don't want to be, I don't want a support worker anymore. I'm like, great. That's what shadow work is. <clears throat> That's why I've been committing to wearing more black because I'm here to integrate the parts of myself that I've been denying the insignificant parts of myself, the, the wounded child parts of me that have been driving the bus of my life. I'm tired of pretending that they're not there. I'm here to master the art and the process of becoming trigger proof, which means taking all of my shadow parts and integrating them to create a whole functional, powerful being that has a gift that wants to share with the universe. <clears throat> the reason why I'm saying that about myself is that the same is true about you. You have that exact potential as well. You have shadow parts of you that you've been raised to think that are unworthy or inappropriate that you've fractured and abandoned from in service of approval and seeking you know, validation externally, which is normal, which is how we all are. But then you won't be able to heal if you keep denying those parts. So becoming trigger proof is really about owning all the parts of ourselves that we have been seeing as uh, weak, stupid, not worthy of love and undeserving, not even good enough. We all have that. And so we don't know that it's there until re relationships happen. So I want to talk about how this actually deals with rejection because understanding this background and connecting this to feelings of rejection, what we then do is we're able to then heal from feelings of rejection because we understand the context of what it's really about. So if you've been dealing with content of relationship dynamics where you're feeling rejected, and this was inspired by one of my VIP clients I'm working with who feels so angry with her partner <clears throat> because there isn't a physical connection. There isn't a words of affirmation the way that she wants. <laughs> and there's this kind of dynamic where when she wants to say, okay, I've had it, I leave, then her partner's like, no, come back and gives all of that affirmation. And then within a short period of time, back to the old pattern. So it's a classic push-pull dynamic trauma bond. It's very common if you're going through it. But what happened was is this really deep fear of rejection came up. And when we don't really get to the context of this, then we're forever arguing over content. I don't think it's too much to ask for so-and-so. Why don't you call me and say that? And we go back into circles and we're in the content. And part of the training of becoming trigger-proof that we teach in our programs is it's never about the con content. And in order for you to understand how to heal from this concept of rejection, if you've been dealing with that, let me know in the comments section right now, if you've been dealing with rejection lately, whether it's work or clients or 
you know, even in your uh, love life. Let me know if, if, if this is resonating or landing with you. By the way, if you're watching on replay, give me a hashtag replay. Let me know where you're listening from and what your takeaway was. Because I really, I read the comments because I want to know how this is landing for you. Because I'm just talking to a camera. We're in COVID times. I miss having an audience where I can interact. I'm a very interactive kind of person. So this is very difficult for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm breaking free from my comfort zone. I'll be okay, but I'm just saying I really would love your, your engagement with this. So essentially rejection, in order to heal from feelings of rejection, we have to go out of the content of the rejection and get into the context. What do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. <clears throat> he picked her over me. All right. If you've ever had that experience where you're with somebody and all of a sudden he picked her over you, she picked him or her, whatever you're, whatever you're into, that's all good, over me. Now, this is very relevant because we, Diana and I are looking to buy a home and the market is really challenging right now. There's no inventory. So as soon as a crappy piece of property comes up, even though it's a piece of shit, it'll be way overpriced, and then they'll have 100 people bidding for it. So this happened to us like a month or two ago when we found the perfect place, the perfect home. Oh, it was great. And then the, 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 we made an offer, and then the, uh, the seller went with somebody else. And oh, oh my God, he picked them over us. Oh, I felt the rejection. It was there. So I know if you've ever had that experience, let me know if you've ever had that experience. He picked him over me. This is the content. What I'd like for you to do with that content, you're going to go, you're going to go, the next question you're, you're going to ask yourself, this is part of the work we teach is, what am I making that mean about me? Okay, what's the story you're making up about that? He picked him over me. Well, you ask this client when we work with, well, it means that I'll never be chosen. He picked her over me. I will never be chosen. You've made an event. Now, I will never be chosen. Now, the context of this, to really understand how to deal with that and heal that, we got to go to what this is really about. It's not about he picking her over you and you'll never be chosen. This is from the context, excuse me, of an abandonment wound. This is classic. When you were younger, mom and dad divorced, uh, or um, dad had an affair, and boom, those feelings as a five-year-old, six-year-old, 10-year-old came up at that moment is that I will never be chosen. They, he chose, it's like dad has the affair, but in your body, your experience is I'm not enough. I'll never be chosen. So when you're 18, 20, 30, 40, you have this date with somebody, dating for a couple months, and then he turns around and says, yeah, I met somebody else. Boom. Now, the abandonment wound from childhood has now come up. So the story you're making was that you're rejected, but the, in fact, you weren't rejected. It was somebody else's preferences that because you had this wound of abandonment, you took it as a rejection of you means I will never be good enough. I'm not good enough. I will never be chosen. We Rejection is when we take an event that's happening, and we remove the feelings from it. That's just an event, and then we make a meaning, and we feel rejected. Rejection is actually what we're doing to ourselves in that moment. In that moment, when as a child, when dad had the affair, chose someone else, deep down inside that moment as a child, you unconsciously abandon yourself. You said, it's because I'm not good enough. That's self-abandonment. He chose some, I'm not good enough. You abandoned yourself in that moment. Dad chose whatever dad did, but you rejected yourself in that moment. So when you have this scenario, when someone chooses somebody else, you then feel rejection because you were rejecting you. Does this make sense? 
Now, this is very difficult to see. Your ego will not want to see that <coughs> because it's hidden in your shadows. Excuse me. It's dry. Dry here. It's in your shadows, and it's, and it's very difficult to see because you don't want to feel that pain. But when you have the right guide and you have the right training, you're able to experience something, find out, have the feelings, go back to the younger context of that eight-year-old whose father had that affair, you're able to reparent that younger part of you and then come back and go, yeah, it hurts, but it doesn't actually mean that I'll never be chosen. And you're now, your mindset completely shifts and you're able to become trigger-proof to rejection in that moment. Does that help? That's example number one. I'm going to give two more examples. Example number two of rejection. I didn't get the promotion at work. If you've ever been passed over for a promotion, you didn't get that promotion, you weren't chosen, boom, immediately, I must not be good enough. Now, that's the context. I must not be good enough. Didn't get the promotion. Oh, I feel rejected. No, no, no. That's content. What's the context? Well, the context is I must not be good enough. That's the underlying vibe. That's the belief that you're coming in with, right? And you guys want to see Dominic in a few minutes? I'll bring him out. I think he woke up from, is he up from a nap? Oh, no, he's still napping. Okay, cool. I want to introduce you. Um, so I must, I must not be good enough is there. Now, where does it actually come from is the real question you want to ask yourself. Where does that come from? If you've ever had that experience, <clears throat> I invite you to ask that. How do you do that? Well, we show this to you in our overview experience, in all our trainings. You quiet yourself. You open up space. You allow yourself to feel the feelings of I must not be good enough. It's very painful to do. Your ego will not want to do it, by the way. That's why it's good to have a guide. I'll tell you to do this work. Facebook Live is great, but you're not going to actually do it because you got to have a container. <laughs> Some people will do it because they practice. But to really just sink in the feeling of I must not be good enough and just feel those sensations and then ask, where does this come from? And you'll notice that this will come from a lack of perceived support from your parents growing up. Again, it all comes back to childhood. It all comes back when you are younger and you say, in my case, um, you know, I want to be a chiropractor. And my parents say, why don't you become a real doctor? Deep down inside, my younger teenage self has the experience of, oh, I don't have perceived support. Even though they're totally supporting me in their own values, they don't, know, don't understand chiropractic, all that. They totally are supporting me in their own values, but my teenage self makes up a story that I'm not worthy of being supported. I must not be good enough exactly as I am. And that feeling stays in my body, and I experience it again and again and again and again. And I'll collect and gather evidence of my not enoughness, people who didn't, you know, show up on dates, people who dumped me, <clears throat> applications for things that I get denied in. I have so many evidences of my not enoughness. I've been accumulating it since I was a kid, just like you have. So when it gets triggered, that shadow gets triggered. I don't know what to do with it. I then turn around, stay in the content and story. Oh, I must not be good enough. I'm a failure. I'm not going to try which it doesn't necessarily mean that I must not be good enough. You know, it's somebody else's preferences. And there's many other jobs. If I had the tools, I can resource myself, take the hit, and then use it to actually improve instead of, boom, unraveling and not having that feeling processed. And it builds and builds. And these unresolved rejections that you haven't worked through they build up in your nervous system and they create illness. You know, what's at stake here is the conversation of your health and healing. The more you do this work, I do this work so that I'm in my 60s, 70s, and 80s, and I'm not bogged down by chronic illness. This is chronic illness. What I'm telling you right now is the accumulation of rejections over time. Throw in a divorce here. Throw in a challenge, you know, a, a breakdown, a financial collapse here, a business breakup, and they accumulate and they wear our nervous systems down and then that's what creates chronic illness. 
<clears throat> and nowhere do you learn the tools in actually getting into the body and extracting them. We just go talk it through and tell our stories and share the content. Are you okay? There's something, uh, there's an alarm that's going off right now. Sorry. Um, so the, the, um, the context is really about going into where it all comes from. The perceived lack of support from that child and powerful tools in dropping into your body, increasing capacity, feeling the feelings, all of the shit you don't want to do. Why? Because it's scary. You know, you've been doing counseling and therapy to avoid feeling shit. You've been doing, you've been doing personal development work, thing and the crystals and fucking, you know, meditation retreats to not feel this shit. Crystals and hypnotherapy to not feel shit. Whereas when people come and do the work we do, they're like, oh my God, I've done all this work for 20 years. I've been doing it to avoid feeling shit. And this six weeks, this eight weeks that we've been working together has been the most transformative of my life because I'm no longer avoiding feelings. What we're doing is we're going in into the body sensations of that little five-year-old, that little eight-year-old, and feeling the feelings of rejection and abandonment. And a really powerful thing happens when you give yourself permission to do that. And you have a space and a container and a community that we're all doing it together for the conversation of healing. A powerful thing happens when you're willing to feel your insignificance and you're able to dig deep and dig it out and scoop it out and see it and unpack it and make friends with it, you open up a container for significance and connection and joy to pour in. When you give yourself permission and the space and a container to dig deep into those uncomfortable feelings you've been avoiding and going to therapy to not have to deal with, don't worry, I won't tell, <laughs> you actually are able to dig deep and scoop them out and work them through you got to feel it to heal it. You got to admit it to shift it. The feelings come up so that they can leave. And as they release through tears, through energy, through emotion, your body then feels lighter. You then have a state of calm. You don't start acting out of a needy wounding, feeling rejected, and then reacting to rejection by being like passive aggressive or running away. You actually are a fucking functional adult, not acting from a wound, and you realize that they're not rejecting you. They're like, I totally understand why that was chosen. It's not the right fit for me. I know that I have a new one coming, even though that hurt. This reminds me of when my dad did it, but I was able to integrate that. I'm totally good. That's becoming trigger proof. I love myself even more now, and I have even more confidence, and now I'm able to step up. Is this resonating with you? When you learn this, <clears throat> you become more courageous in stepping out because you're not stopped by a fear of rejection anymore. You don't take it personally. Everything becomes personal when you don't do it. And when, when, if I'm in a relationship with you and I fucking take every little goddamn thing you say or do or don't do personally, you won't feel safe around me. You'll be like, oh, God, he's a lot of work. I got to manage this guy's emotions. I got to hide myself, my truth, so that I don't fucking trigger him because he just doesn't know how to resource his triggers. He's so goddamn volatile. I can't speak the truth around him because he can't handle his fucking emotions. He takes everything personally, and he thinks he makes everything, every feedback that I say, he takes defensively because he makes it about him rather than hearing me. Does this make sense? When I don't do the work, then in my relationship with you, you won't feel safe to be yourself around me because you're now worried, oh my gosh, if I say this the wrong way, he's going to take it as rejection, he's going to get hurt. And then, ah, uh, and then when I do this work, you're able to give me feedback. And I get feedback pretty much every day. I get haters and trolls on my social media on the daily, and it doesn't feel great. But... With e as I lean into every re perceived rejection, I'm able to resource myself more. I actually become more and more powerful. Instead of looking for a solution to this rejection thing, 
look for a process to turn the rejection into deeper self-love. That's where you have freedom. That is where doors open up and your whole experience of life changes. You show up more courageously. You show up able to look into a camera in the eye, completely, fully self-expressed, not putting on a show, but just being the real you, not pretending. You can see it. You can tell when somebody's on camera and they're being themselves. As soon as a camera comes into somebody's face, all of a sudden they're like, mm. I have to pretend to be somebody else because the real me is not lovable. So I'm going to put on this mask so that you like me. It comes through in our bodies. It's time to stop trying to talk our way out of these feeling problems. These are, 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 must be addressed at the somatic level, at a body-based level. And when you do, you don't have to say, look at all the work that I've done. I've done this and this and this work, and I've done all of this work. You won't have to tell anybody. People will look at you and feel you and go, fuck. You're different, right? It's like going to the gym. If I've gone to the gym three hours a day for like six months and you haven't seen me during that time, when I see you, I won't have to go, look at me. I just gone to the gym. Tell me how beautiful I look. You'll be like, whoa, Nemo, whoa. You've completely transformed. That's what happens to our clients when they learn and they take on dancing with this dark passenger and becoming trigger proof taking full ownership, not blame for those wounded parts in childhood. The context that everybody's arguing content. What about this? What about this? Is it too much to ask? I mean, what about this? The question that, that, they'll, that, that you might be asking when you're in a content thing is, do I have to find this acceptable? Is that acceptable? Where do I draw the line? Content, content, content. When you have to ask that question, the answer is within you if you're willing to dive deep and go after the context. When you answer the context, you come back into the content, you won't have to, you'll actually be able to set a boundary. You'll ask for what you want and you, you ask for what you want and you are prepared to walk away if it's not there. Why? Because you love yourself that much, because you've chosen yourself that much. And if you choose yourself that much, somebody else, only if you choose yourself that much will somebody else choose you. Let me say that again. Only if you invest in yourself and choose yourself first will somebody else choose you. It doesn't work the other way around. You're being treated exactly the way you're treating you. The end. And when I discovered the truth of this and I started treating myself the way that I was expecting other people to treat me, <clears throat> all of a sudden, what other people said and did didn't matter. Guess what happened to how other people treated me? Everybody treats me with a great deal of respect. Yeah, I get the odd Karen and Ken on my thing, but I don't engage. I completely understand. They can attack me. I know where it's coming from. But for the most part, people treat me really well. And it's all because of the reflection of how I'm treating myself. You know, I can, sh you, I can show up because I show up with kindness. I don't try to be nice. There's a difference between being nice and being kind. Being kind is I'm giving from a place of abundance. Being nice is I'm not resourced and I need your approval. So I'm going to put on a fake nice mask so that I have your approval because I don't have it within myself. That's very manipulative. So your nice guy game or nice girl game, you think that's what you're supposed to be doing. But that's very manipulative. Unconsciously, your work is as you do this work, you can be kind and you don't have to be nice. Some people don't deserve your niceness. <laughs> Some people don't deserve your kindness because they're treating you like absolute shit. You can set a boundary and say, all right, that's a no for me. You know, I'm happy, happy to, 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 to remove people from my community who are like disruptive and just being assholes. You don't tolerate abusive behavior. You can understand it, but you won't tolerate it, right? You'll be your, because of the boundaries, the definitions of who you are are so clear. So number three, I wanted to give you uh, example number three. <clears throat> I wasn't invited to the party. Rejection. Oh, Facebook. Oh my gosh, there's a party going on. Everybody was there. I wasn't invited. You've had that experience? I certainly have. What happens? Boom, this feeling of rejection. What's the story that I'm making up? Well, the story is that 
I'm not fun. Nobody really loves me. That's the content. Going deeper into the context, I'm not lovable. Basically, what happens is, as a child, this is where it all comes from, the feeling of rejection comes from somebody else's preferences is interpreted as my lack. Somebody chooses that, that means that I'm lacking. And that comes from a deep wound in childhood. Right? And yes, it hurts. But when you're not invited to a party, okay, which happens to me, happens to me all the time. There's lots of parties that happen that I'm not invited to. Right? In that moment, when I have unresolved woundings from those younger parts in my shadow, the inner child, I'm going to then interpret that as I'm not fun. They don't love me. And then I'm going to get angry. Then if I st stay stuck in my eight-year-old wound, I'm going to call them. I'm going to cuss them out. I'm going to be like, why don't you invite me? Why don't you? So then not realizing that now I'm guilting somebody else and inviting me. Why don't you give me physical affection? Now I have to, now I have to guilt you into being intimate with me, like out of guilt. You know, who wants to fuck that? <laughs> it's, we then start to show up as wounded children, which is the exact opposite of attractive and safety, emotional and psychological safety. If I'm hanging out, if you're hanging out with me and I'm stuck in my eight-year-old wound, the last thing you want to do is fuck me, <laughs> get intimate with me, invite me to a party. Because quite frankly, when I'm stuck in that wound, I'm not that, you know, that nobody, that's not something that's magnetic. The magnetic part of you is the part of you that is able to resource that younger self that perceived other people's preferences as your own lack. And you're able to give that younger part of you all the love so that that younger part of you, which is still very much driving the bus of your life, is now regulated. That amygdala, that, in, that implicit memory that's in the body of your unworthiness and your lacking of good enoughness is taken care of. And now something changes. You now show up resourced. You now show up fully self-loving. You now show up as emotionally safe with your cup full, not looking to others for validation. That is your most attractive self. When someone's trying too hard, the last trying to, if I'm trying really hard to get you to like me, the last thing you want to do is to, is to give me that approval when I'm desperately seeking it. Why? Because it's manipulative. Because it's not really about connecting with you. It's a needy, unresourced part that doesn't make you feel seen. I'm just using you to get my validation. You're my fucking battery and because it's not coming. Now I'm angry at you, wanting it, not realizing that the behavior that I'm giving you is the exact fucking opposite of what inspires you to feel a pull and a magnetism towards me. I'm literally shooting myself in the foot by not resolving the core context of what this perceived rejection is about. Is this making sense to you? Rejection is a story that you are making up that's deeply embedded in your body that was no fault of your own, <clears throat> that you were born into, that you experience because of your unconscious parenting patterns and your unawareness of it. And here we are in this conversation. The question is, what are you going to do about it? You can listen to this Facebook Live and go, oh, wow, that was great. Thank you, Nima. That was very eye-opening. Good. Okay. But then what? Are you actually going to take responsibility and heal those attachment wounds? Do you know what opens up for you when you do? True self-worth, true power, true freedom, true self-expression, an ability to speak your truth and share your gifts with the world. There is nothing more important in this world than you living according to your creative self-expression. But if you have rejection wounds that are, that are driving the bus, there's no way that you're going to get your voice to speak because you're too afraid of this perceived rejection 
which isn't your fault, it's just unresolved wounding. But when you do, you can put yourself out there, which is risky. I put myself out there, holy crap, I blink, I wake up, and there's like 5,400 people as of April 13th in my trigger-proof Facebook group. Holy shit, I never, never imagined that. But that means that many eyes are judging me and making judgments and making criticisms. The question is, do I have a firm knowing of myself? I do now, and I'm developing it as I go. I'm a, I'm a work in progress. The more certain I become, because I've integrated those younger parts of myself, I've actually done the work. I don't just talk about it. I don't have to say, <clears throat> I don't have to say, well, look at what I've done. Let me give you my resume. I've done this, this, this. <clears throat> See this constantly with clients. They just give me their fucking resume, and it's like, okay, so why is it that you can't speak to your mother then? You've done 20 years of counseling. You've done all of this manifesting stuff, crystals, whatever shit that you've done, hypnotherapy. Cool. You know how I can tell you've done the work? The mother that you once saw as your perpetrator who, who was really mean and whatever, are you able to see her with loving awareness? Are you able to hug her in a room and not have your body just go into a fucking conniption fit about it? That's how I can tell if you've done the work. I can tell you've done the work when you don't have to fucking brag about it. You can actually, it comes through you, through your authenticity. Authenticity is the new enlightenment. I don't give a shit about enlightenment anymore. All I care about is being my real self and expressing my real self and, and, and the secure attachments in my life, in my inner circle, with my clients, my community, <clears throat> my, my child and my wife my parents, my family, myself, you know, all I care about is uh, giving my, and, and this new awareness that I've had, that I've been able to transform my entire life and my health and my relationships around through this work, that I want to give that gift to humanity, is that I, that's my gift that I want to give. So I create opportunities to just keep giving my gift. And as I do give my gift, from a place of authenticity, the, my life around me starts to expand. People want to be in my presence. They, you know, want my time. They want to be part of my programs. They want to be my friend. They want my time. They want, you know, it just, your magnetism, which is already part of you, it just comes through you on the other side of this work. But you got to be willing to face the parts of you that were rejected. So I invite you, if you are called to go deeper, to join us. Uh, at our, I have a, two workshops happening tomorrow back to back, should I stay or should I go? And the uh, one I do with the tribe, which is recreating relationships, which is really low cost or free, which are great info, info, information, but it's not transformation. Transformation happens when you come to the breathwork and badassery, which is coming up on this Saturday. Check, your, check the, the, the times. It's worth it uh, to show up and breathe and do the, that inner child work and have a container where I, yours truly, get to guide you into connecting with those little rejected parts of yourself and finding that power so that you can give that to yourself. Why do I do this? Because I stand for healed families. I'm here to break my gift is the gift that helps to break the cycle of intergenerational trauma that didn't start with you. It's not your fault, <clears throat> but it's your responsibility. How do I know? Well, you're listening to this conversation. You were put on this earth to break the cycles of the, the trauma cycles in your family dynamics. You were put on this earth for that purpose. You're here to break those cycles. How do I know? Well, because it's not your mom or dad or brother or sister because they're not listening to this, this transmission. You're listening to it. It means this will awaken something and you say, yeah. And then you'll resist. You'll say, no, I don't want to do it because you're going to want someone else to do it. But you can't run away from it. If you're now taking the red pill. And uh, you must be the one to change that cycle. Your family's life is at stake. Your health is at stake. Your children's future is at stake. Just like you are repeating the patterns, we download them onto the others unless we rescue those younger parts of ourselves and learn these tools and master our nervous systems. And this is what I love teaching, and this is my gift to the planet. Follow the links below and join me. And... Uh, Jump through, uh, jump through the portal and learn how to be your own medicine. See you at the next perfect time.